So I'll start off. I'm uh, Jackie Ballou Erdos. I'm the director of the squash program at NYU Langone. Uh, I won't be speaking first, but just wanted to start off uh, the presentation by telling you the title of our talk, Partnering with Families in Nutrition Care. And this is William. Hi, everyone. I don't know how many of you have heard uh, Dad speak before, but my name is William Diaz. And I'll be sharing my story with you today. So I have two boys, one with celiac disease and one without. Um, at the age of six, my wife and I realized that Matthew, my youngest son, wasn't growing at the same pace as his brother. He also started developing dark circles under his eyes. So we adjusted his bedtime. We brought our concerns to his pediatrician. And we were told... Um, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> we brought our attention to the pediatrician, and we were told, all kids are different. Just give us some time. <coughs> After three years of this, we were finally um, referred, to by a, referred to a GI specialist where Matthew was then diagnosed with celiac disease. Um, Dr. Levine will speak more about celiac disease. Good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk about celiac disease and probably try to use it as a as an example of, of obviously a nutritional example of, of how the importance of uh, that it is with part understanding the medical part of it, but more importantly, partnering with the families uh, and the the central role that you all have uh, in, um, in in the uh, in affecting the improvement in, the, in these children. So. Um, Celiac disease, as you know, is a chronic inflammatory disorder. Um, it has an immune basis for it, uh, and there is a genetic predisposition, so that oftentimes it runs in families, um, and the genetics are relatively well worked out. Um, there's a certain uh, what's called HLAs, uh, and there are genetic testing which can tell whether you have a strong or a weak predisposition to developing celiac disease. Um, celiac disease occurs after exposure to um, gluten. Gluten um, it has basically several substances, part of it, and it's the gliadin portion of gluten that's, that is the, um, that is the uh, people have recognized as the cause for the inflammatory disorder, and that is found in several substances, especially wheat, barley, and rye. Um, Despite having this genetic predisposition, though, um, no one really understands why there is a trigger, so why people actually develop it. Uh, some people have the genetic predisposition and don't develop it, and you could also develop it at various stages of lifetime. So nobody really understands what that trigger is, but what we do know is that the incidence is significantly increasing, um, and it's probably estimated that about one in 100 people in the United States have celiac disease, which is a huge number. Um, this is a uh, graph of people, um, uh, ha the incidence of celiac disease, so uh, one can see part of it is, is due to the better recognition uh, of many people, physicians and, uh, and the lay people, about celiac disease. But really, this is also not only that. This is obviously a significantly strong increased incidence over the last uh, several decades. Celiac disease is diagnosed by a combination of really, um, uh, it's characterized by sort of a blood tests which are abnormal and it's called sort of autoantibodies. Um, and then uh, the patients have what's called intestinal inflammation, but the symptoms are quite, <coughs> excuse me, quite variable. Uh, and if actually some mother today just asked me, <coughs> you know, what are the symptoms? And I say anything could be a symptom of celiac disease. So uh, it could have <coughs> intestinal complaints, it could be poor growth. But there is a, um, certainly many patients who are asymptomatic. <clears throat> so the classic presentation that um, people had uh, and people recognized uh, early on um, was that of a young child uh, who is irritable, uh, having diarrhea, <clears throat> poor weight gain, uh, and uh, has significant abdominal distension. And this all sort of started several months after the introduction of gluten to a baby's diet. So <clears throat> typically it will be uh, a year, 15 months old child who, um, who then has, starts to developing these symptoms. <clears throat> However, um, it is now known that there are many other types of presentations. There's the non-classical 
sort of intestinal presentation, uh, which can be confused with the most common disorder around, which is irritable bowel syndrome. Um, and so that's any sort of functional type of disorders uh, can actually be, the, be from celiac disease. Uh, and there are others that are non-intestinal. Um, they include rashes, short stature, osteoporosis, infertility in, the, um, in, in patients uh, uh, who, um, who are of childbearing age. Uh, and there actually are some neurologic manifestations uh, of, of celiac disease, which the neurologists are now starting to become a little bit more aware of. And finally, there are the really those patients who are truly asymptomatic. Uh, those are usually picked up um, when, you're, when they're screened because uh, some other relative has developed celiac disease, and it's thought that the prevalence of celiac disease in those who ha uh, first-degree relatives is about 10%. Um, so uh, oftentimes they're, they're screened and they're found to have it even though they're really, really asymptomatic. <clears throat> this is what's called a celiac iceberg. Um, with the symptomatic patients with celiac disease, the only ones that are seen above the surface. Um, however, uh, there are those who are sort of asymptomatic, um, thought to be silent celiac disease, whereas if you actually went in and biopsy them, they would have abnormalities. And then there are those who are what's called latent celiac disease, who are genetically susceptible, um, but uh, don't have actual inflammation when you go ahead and do the biopsies. Um, and so uh, then if you think about the prevalence being one in 100, the number of patients who are actually either have latent celiac disease or really silent celiac disease is actually astounding. <clears throat> the way you make a diagnosis um, is a combination of, in these days, is a combination of the serology, meaning the blood tests being abnormal, um, usually the serology is dictated by somebody having symptoms. So you have some symptoms that tell somebody to do the blood tests, although, again, it could be uh, in an asymptomatic patient with a relative who has it. Uh, once the serology is not normal, currently the recommendations are to do a biopsy, uh, and the biopsy shows what classical inflammation. Uh, yet that does not clinch the diagnosis, um, and the diagnosis is actually thought to be once you have the combination of the serology and the, and, the, and the inflammation, you go then go on to treatment, and you see a response to treatment. For those who are having symptoms, you'll see improvement in their symptoms. For those um, who have abnormal serology, you'll see improvement in the serology. And if all that fits a normal, nice, smooth picture, you have celiac disease. Um, there are, it's not necessarily always so classical, uh, and so that oftentimes you may have to follow them up, repeat the biopsies, but the typical patient um, is basically seen with a combination of serology, abnormal biopsy, and response to treatment. <clears throat> there are a whole bunch of diseases that are associated with celiac disease, um, and it's, again, being that it's thought to be an autoimmune disorder, other autoimmune diseases such as thyroid disease and diabetes have strong associations. Um, with celiac disease, and many of our endocrine colleagues now uh, do routine screening in those patients and families who have children who have diabetes or have thyroid abnormalities. In addition, a bunch of syndromes, um, like such as Down syndrome, uh, Turner syndrome, and Williams syndrome have strong, high, increased uh, incidence of celiac disease. And finally, those patients who have IgA deficiency. Now, IgA deficiency um, is a very, very common, the most common immune deficiency around. is thought to occur in about 1 in 500. Um, the reason it's important, well, it's too, important for two reasons. Uh, it's important to the gastroenterologists because IgA deficiency is associated with a lot of GI abnormalities. But it's also important to everybody as far as screening for celiac disease because the screening for celiac disease depends on you having IgA. So if you don't have IgA, um, which is an immunoglobulin, you can't really screen effectively, which makes the diagnosis even more difficult to, to, uh, to attain. So, um, so these are some of the associations that we see uh, and are known to, uh, to be related to celiac disease. A little scientific for three seconds. Uh, again, uh, what happens is that if you have the genetic abnormality, and you're exposed to gliadin, um, you get recognition by a bunch of inflammatory cells. Um, there are those cells that activate a bunch of um, enzymes which basically then adhere to what's called the intraepithelial lymphocytes. Those are cells on the epithelial surface, the surface of the lining of the intestine. When those are there, they activate the immune system, and there are two, a whole bunch of cascades or two parts of the immune system that get activated. Um, they're actually damaged directly to the, um, to the intestinal lining, or they 
bring in other cells and other substances that are activate the immune system. So you get sort of a two-pronged attack. Uh, and then there, somewhere in that process, the gut becomes permeable, uh, meaning the intestine becomes permeable and stuff gets across the intestine, the glide in particular, which then causes a more of the inflammatory cascade, which ultimately leads to, um, to, uh, to the damage to the intestine. There's a substance that you'll probably hear more about over the next couple of years called zonulin, um, which is a substance that keeps the intestine, that regulates how that intestine is, um, is, is how permeable the intestine is. The more zonulin you have, the more, um, the less likely the intestine is to be tight, and so therefore the more stuff gets across the intestine. And so there's a, some relationship between uh, this material and the persistence of the inflammation. And this is a sort of a cartoon, which just is a shortened version of a cartoon, which basically shows how complicated this whole thing is. Um, in the middle is the genetic predisposition, which is that HLA stuff, which interacts with T cells, and everything sort of cascades from then. It causes damage to the intestine. It goes to other substances, such as the thyroid and the pancreas and the brain. Uh, and so um, you could see how it's not only a specific intestinal disorder, but it's sort of an overall inflammatory disorder of the whole, of the whole system. There are other factors that we know have to be involved. Again, we, we know there's a genetic predisposition, but even within first-degree relatives, there's only 10% incidence. Um, we know if you have the genetics, you don't necessarily have the disease, um, although there's a high incidence. So there's many other factors which must be, must be involved. What those factors are are unknown. So environmental factors, we, we suspect, or some of us suspect are involved, maybe as part of the trigger that starts this whole inflammatory cascade, but nobody really knows. Um, there is some studies that have suggested that breastfeeding may be protective, but it may not necessarily be the breastfeeding. It may be that for those people who are, those children who are breastfed, they may uh, have a later incident, in, introduction of gluten. There are some Swedish studies where the Sweden, in Sweden they were encouraged early on uh, as part of their progressive uh, in, um, medical, medical care, they were encouraged early on to start a uh, gluten uh, uh, feeding. And they noticed several years later that the incidence of celiac disease skyrocketed, which was probably related to the fact that they introduced gluten at a much earlier age uh, in that period of time. So the age of introduction of gluten may have a factor. Um, we know the intestine is more permeable the younger the patient. So if you hold off on that, maybe they're less likely to develop it. Um, there's also some studies that have su suggested that if you get an infection early on that makes you, and you have that genetic predisposition, you may be more likely to develop celiac disease. Again, the, the thinking being that the in infection causes damage to the intestine, which makes it more permeable, which makes the gliding get across easier. And then if you're genetically predisposed, you may develop the celiac disease at an, early, at an earlier stage. Treatment is dietary. Um, so dietary elimination um, of the substances with gliadin, wheat, rye, and barley. Um, I always tell patients this is sort of being pregnant. Either you're pregnant or you're not pregnant. Either you're on the diet or you're not on the diet. Uh, and so, um, again, this is not like an allergy where if you, you know, if you're allergy and you don't have a reaction, you're okay. This is, it's either an all or a nothing. And the all reason for that is twofold. One is because of the actual inflammation and the symptoms, but it's also to potentially prevent the long-term consequences of untreated or undertreated celiac disease. Oats are controversial. Uh, and uh, we may never understand uh, the answer to that. We know that some patients do not, well, oats do not have gliadin in it. So in general, oats are not part of the same family of wheat, rye, and barley. So theoretically, it should be okay. Problems are that, first of all, there's cross-contamination. Um, and the cross-contamination may be in the field where they're grown. It may be in the, in, in where they're processed. Um, we do know that patients some patients do not tolerate oats, um, and we're not sure whether, the, whether that's because of the cross-contamination or not. There was a recent study that I just actually saw, which looked at very, some fancy ways of monitoring some of the patients with, with celiac disease on oats. It may not be that serology is helpful, so our recommendations for the most part are not to use it at least until after puberty. Um, Occasion, you know, that does make their diet even more restrictive than before. But again, our feelings are that if we, at best we could, should try to eliminate oats as well. 
obviously there are other good substances or reasonable substances um, to, for those patients who have to stay off these, these material. Again, it's much easier these days. Um, uh, when I uh, first started in this business, it was, it was like a kiss of death to these poor families. Uh, they, you know, there was nothing to eat. They couldn't go out to eat. And now there are restaurants that are gluten-free. Um, you can go to supermarkets and see a whole selection of gluten-free products. Um, I caution you that what is, you know, again, what's required to be gluten-free is below a certain, is above a certain level of gluten. It doesn't necessarily mean they're really 100% gluten-free, but we do the best we can. But again, it's usually relatively simple for those families to. Um, to at least embark on the gluten-free diet together with the assistance of all the people in this room. Um, in addition, there are a bunch of other things that one has to take into account. First of all, vitamin issues. Uh, you know, again, there are vitamin deficiencies that are seen in patients with celiac disease, um, and so they do need to be monitored. One of the most important ones is vitamin D, um, and so bone health is extremely important. As I mentioned earlier on, osteoporosis as a manifestation of the disease is common, uh, and so we do screen these patients and follow them for, with bone, for, bone, for their bone health. Again, remembering that the pediatric age group is the is this time where calcium gets incorporated into bones. That's going to stop once you go through puberty. So if you if you're, have inflammation and active inflammation throughout that time period, you're setting yourself up for problems forever. Um, so bone health is extremely important, and that's why we really are relatively strict in the pediatric age group with regard to anything, including oats, um, to make sure that we really have no inflammation whatsoever. There are some data that shows that response to vaccines, early vaccines, was not as effective as it should be. Hepatitis B is one of the classical ones, um, so we do actually screen for hepatitis, response to hepatitis B, and we frequently have to revaccinate these patients um, once they've been diagnosed with celiac disease because they didn't respond well to the initial vaccination. And we do screen for other associated abnormalities, again, specifically thyroid ab antibodies. Again, it's important to maintain a strict diet. Um, blood tests are useful to assess compliance, uh, but may not necessarily be the entire picture. Uh, and also to prevent complications. Again, there is a, um, a growing body of literature that suggests that small bowel lymphomas occur in patients with, un with persistent intestinal inflammation, such as celiac disease. So we do encourage that you have to be really strict about it to prevent some of these complications. But as, but as we've sort of been alluding to, this is really a whole family problem. It's not just a child, a child is part of a family, uh, and we do have to have parental involvement with the young children, and extremely important uh, to have frank discussions with the adolescents um, uh, because of the long-term risks of undertreatment. The hardest patients to treat are the adolescents who are asymptomatic, so the ones that are picked up um, because some family member has it and they have no symptoms whatsoever to get an adolescent to go on the diet is extremely difficult. It's much easier for the two-year-old who has failure to thrive and, and, and diarrhea and they go off the diet and, and the, they, go off, they go on the diet and they feel better and they go off the diet and have diarrhea the next minute. Then it's relatively simple, uh, but it's the older patients really which require a lot of convincing and a lot of, a lot of work. New treatments down the road, um, there are work to genetically modify wheat to make it so that potentially um, they don't activate the immune system. Um, there is a zonulin material, and if we prevent the zonulin from being upregulated, uh, meaning too much zonulin, potentially we could keep the intestine sort of tight and prevent the, even though you may have the genetic predisposition, the gliadin doesn't get into the intestine uh, or cross the intestinal barrier, and therefore it doesn't activate the immune system. Uh, and ultimately, there's an attempt to do vaccines to prevent this trigger, but we don't really know what the trigger is. So again, it's, it's a little hard to make sure um, that, you know, we're sort of preventing the onset of the disease when we don't know what's the underlying cause for it is. Um, there are many different researches. We do a bunch of them looking at disease presentation, the effect of oats, um, where actually there is some hint that the zonulin is also found in the kidneys. So there's a hint that actually patients with celiac disease may have kidney abnormalities as well, and we're in the process of looking at that, and also trying to look at some triggers um, probably environmental triggers that could be the, the causing that in those who are genetically predisposed to developing celiac disease. Um, so the celiac disease is a chronic disorder. 
requiring long-term nutritional therapy. Um, it requires management not only specifically of the removal of the gluten from the diet, but it also requires looking to make sure that you don't have any of the other complications that can be seen with that. Uh, and the most important aspect of care, of course, is the partnering with the families. Um, we do have the squash, the advantage here of the squash program, which has been able to allow us to sort of pursue that uh, and have what we have a, sort of a multidisciplinary approach with a whole celiac disease program, which involves not only myself and other physicians, but it involves our nurses, involves our dietitians, a social worker, we have a coordinator, to all look again, and the idea being that this is a family disorder uh, and we need to have a sort of a f whole family approach to ensuring uh, adequate health. Uh, and this is just our celiac disease, members of our celiac disease program, uh, some of whom are here, um, who are really extremely important. And so again, we don't want, we want, the emphasis is really that you have to understand that we're treating this not in a vacuum. It's not only the physician, it's not only the nutritionist, it's really everybody together working with the families to ensure adequate health. Thank you very much. And with that in mind, as you see Jackie is in that picture right now, why now Jackie will take over. <laughs> Hi again, everyone. My name is Jackie, and as I said, I direct the squash program here at NYU Langone. So I'm going to continue the conversation that Dr. Levine started about partnering with families. And I'm going to tell you about how I truly believe that partnering with families can change the way you practice as a dietitian. I've collaborated with families in a number of ways on my program. From the very beginning, um, families have helped with program development, they've helped implement the program, and they continually evaluate squash. So partnering with families is so important because it ensures that the nutrition education handouts or the programming that you're developing is truly valuable to those patients and families that you work with. I first met William and his son Matthew at a gluten-free cooking class about a year ago. And William, of course, has partnered with us on this presentation today. So the squash program educates uh, children and families about nutrition through engaging activities. And we encourage families to be inspired by nutrition, get involved, and um, you know, think of it not just as uh, us teaching and them learning about it, it's more a back and forth process. So as Fiona mentioned earlier, uh, SQUASH stands for Smart Choices, Quality Ingredients, Unique, Appetizing, Simple, and Healthy. And as all of you already know, teaching nutrition in a way that's just listing off the nutrition benefits of foods is not effective. Using engaging, interactive methods with kids is what works. So in squash, we utilize active learning strategies in all of our programming. And our programs include waiting room activities, cooking classes, lunch and learns, nutrition presentations, and special events. And so I wanted to give you a few more ideas of uh, one particular type of program that I run, and this is the waiting room program. And knowing that most of you, I think, are uh, registered dietitians, a few health professionals, I believe, in the room, um, but I think you can really use ideas from the waiting room program in your practice. If it's not feasible for you to start a weeding room program wherever you work, you can use elements of it. You could uh, refer patients and families to these activities to do between your nutrition appointments to keep them engaged. Um, you could also bring these activities to a health fair or a wellness event. So this activity was inspired by the Food Allergy Research and Education Organization's Teal Pumpkin Campaign. So the Teal Pumpkin Campaign um, raises awareness about food allergies uh, around Halloween when kids are trick-or-treating. So um, having a teal pumpkin on your doorstep tells uh, trick-or-treaters that you have non-food treats available for them. And everyone likes playing with their food, right? So 
these activities are a lot of fun. Um, we call them our food art activities. And this is make a kiwi banana orange palm tree and make your own salad person. And kids get pretty creative with these. Here's um, a taste test along with a presentation. So here we bring a very brief presentation that's mainly pictures to the waiting room and we bring a seasonal fruit or vegetable. Here with the big apple taste test, I always do this in the fall, and I bring three different types of apples that are grown in New York. So we talk about how apples grow, where they grow, and then we have kids rate using all their five senses which apple they like best. And make your own activities are also very popular. So you can use these with a lot of different recipes. You can do this with smoothies or trail mix. But make your own ranch dip mix is um, one where you lay out herbs and spices that go into ranch dip. Kids measure them out, put them in a mason jar, they shake them all up, and you send them home with the recipe for the dip, which all they have to do is add the yogurt to. So research consistently says that partnering with families is a vital component to any successful nutrition education program. So as I said earlier, we've partnered with families in many ways in the squash program. And this all started with bringing an idea for an activity uh, to the Youth Advisory Council. So um, we have a really strong family and youth advisory council at the hospital and the youth advisors are all ages 11 to 17 and they've been patients here at the hospital so various providers and programs bring ideas to this group of teens and ask them what they think so um, i brought a top chef inspired activity to the teens and they tried it out and i got some amazing feedback and it really helped shape the rest of my program I use parent and child surveys. Um, at our cooking classes, I always ask parents for informal feedback, and we partner with families on presentations like today's. So I've learned a lot in working with families. Um, the first, which Randy mentioned earlier, actually, I'm so glad you brought it up, is really tailor your education to who you're working with. So, we don't want families to feel like nutrition education is just something we printed off the internet or it's a handout that we give everyone. We want to make a handout or a program for those families that we're working with and we find that out through partnering with them. I also recommend that you partner with other departments. So um, this is our horticulture therapist. She does gardening activities with the kids in our waiting room. And I also partner with two chefs from the Sylvia Center who teach our cooking classes with the kids for the squash program. And if you don't have the chance to work with a horticulture therapist or a chef, um, I encourage you to see who else you could work with. Is it a physical therapist or a psychologist or a social worker? I find that my most highly rated programs are those in which I partner with another professional. and always ask families for advice. So this trivia wheel, it's on nutrition, uh, was inspired by our youth advisors. They said, why don't you mix things up a little bit and make nutrition education more of a game? And kids and parents really enjoy this activity. So people learn in many different ways. And so in developing the squash program, we wanted to cater our program to the different styles that people learn in. So some people learn through experience. Some people prefer tactile learning and others visual learning. I wanted to speak a little bit about health literacy. So this is something that I didn't learn a ton about when I was in nutrition school, but it's very, very important. So we know that regardless of someone's education level, when you're stressed, your comprehension level decreases. So Working with families, this is so important. If you have a child that's sick, of course that's a stressful situation. So we need to keep our nutrition education materials simple. Don't use complex language, include lots of pictures to explain your message, and a lot of white space. 
And so I learned a lot in particular through working with William and his family. And so William is going to talk next on um, how he wished a few things went a little bit differently when his son Matthew was first diagnosed with celiac disease. The first time we went shopping, we were in the supermarket for hours, reading ingredients is given to us, off a sheet that was given to us by the nutritionist. It was very overwhelming. We decided to go home, go online, and found a lot of research and information about gluten-free expos where Matthew was able to sample different foods and even found um, gluten-free camps that he can attend. <coughs> It was, hold on, so sorry. It would have been really helpful during the initial uh, nutrition visit to get a booklet with some information about gluten-free foods to look out for, um, restaurants, and even ideas for traveling. This booklet also has to have ideas on how to help your child um, deal with his new lifestyle. All right, since Matthew was diagnosed two years ago, I also found out that I was, uh, I have, excuse me, since he was diagnosed two years ago, I also found out that I have celiac disease. Um, since going on a gluten-free diet, he's made great progress in his height, his weight, and the dark circles have gone away. He's also feeling more comfortable with telling other people about him having celiac disease. And this was really helpful. This, what really helped him out with that was him attending a gluten-free sleepaway camp that he went to this summer. Um, he was able to meet and spend the week with a lot of other kids just like him, and that made him feel a lot better. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you so much, William, for telling your story. Um, it's been so wonderful working with your family. Um, and I'm happy to report we've developed some more comprehensive resources since hearing about William's experience, including a gluten-free cookbook that includes all of the kids' favorite recipes from our cooking classes. So you've seen this guy in a lot of the pictures of our presentation. And I thought it would be really important that Matthew share his perspective today. So, so Matthew, when you, when I met you, you told me that you liked learning about celiac disease and nutrition in a certain way. Could you tell the audience how you liked to learn about it? I like to learn about celiac through books. Um, my mom, when she found out that I had celiac, she bought a lot of books off of Amazon. And some of my favorite ones were, um, Mommy, What is Celiac Disease? And um, what that is about is it's about a girl that was diagnosed with celiac disease. And her mom was explaining what celiac was, what can you eat, what can you not eat. And the same thing happened with Eating Gluten-Free with Emily. That was a pretty good book. Um, one of the books that me and my mom really liked was 201 Gluten-Free Recipes for Kids, which really showed a bunch of different recipes that my mom used to make my food. For example, there's some muffins, mac and cheese, chicken nuggets, pizza, and a book that I am wanting to read. It's a chapter book. It's called Celiac is Under Attack. And... <laughs> It seems like a really good book, so I want to read that next. Thanks for sharing those books. Um, I didn't know about all those books <laughs> until you told me. Uh, one thing that uh, Matthew also told me is how you, you felt before attending the gluten-free summer camp. So could you tell the audience a little bit more about how you felt before going? I felt like I was the only one in the world with celiac disease because I really didn't know any, any one of my friends that had it, pretty much anyone that had celiac disease until I went to the camp. 
I saw all these different people that had celiac. So thank you so much, Matthew. I think uh, you did a great job. So in summary, uh, people learn in all different ways, so keep that in mind when you're providing education. Maybe some people learn best through reading a book about it. Tailor your program, know who your audience is, and keep it relevant to them. And ask parents for advice. They know their children the very best. So uh, we have a few minutes available for uh, questions, and you could ask Dr. Levine, myself, William, or Matthew questions. And uh, if we run out of time, we'll all be next door at the Mix and Mingle. So thank you so much for coming today. We all eat gluten free because my mom tried to do it separate. Like, yeah. um, my mom and my brother will eat gluten, and my and then we will eat gluten free. But it, it turned out too hard, so we all eat gluten free meals. Um, I'm 11 years old, and I used to like to eat wheat thins, but we started searching up, and we found something called nut thins, and it's really good. <laughs> this is for Dr. Can you connect uh, gluten sensitivity with celiac, if there is any connection? So again, glu celiac disease has relatively strict criteria. Uh, again, you have to have the blood set up not normal. You have to have the intestinal inflammation. And if you then fit that and response to treatment, if you fit that category, then again, as William said, uh, it's a lifelong strict gluten-free diet. Um, gluten sensitivity is, is, is not celiac disease. So you, the first and most important thing is you have to make sure that it's not celiac disease. Once you're sure that it's not, then at least you could rest assured that you don't have to make sure that there's no ongoing intestinal inflammation because you don't have to worry about the long-term consequences. So I sort of view that more as a allergy like you would for other, many other allergies where um, it's sort of the patient could decide together with you know, those people, you could, you know, you could show nutritionally what, what has gluten in it. But really, for the most part, the patient could decide if they have food with a little bit of stuff in it and it bothers them, don't take it. And similarly, if, it, if, they, if they want to be, um, you know, if it, if it doesn't bother them, they could have it. So uh, gluten sensitivity, and people have different types of sensitivities. I mean, there's behavioral issues. Uh, there are intestinal issues. There's a whole bunch of other things. What that really is, I'm not sure, but I, I think it really, I sort of view it more as more of an alert allergy reaction to it where you don't have, where it's really, it's directed by the symptom. And if the symptom doesn't bother you, it's okay. If it symptom does bother you, you shouldn't take it. But it's not the same strictness that you have to be careful about with celiac disease. That's a great question, um, which is, uh, again, there, there's no data is the answer. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we're looking at it. Um, we do know that there's a whole bunch of, of, of uh, substances that we're all exposed to um, in, in variety of food substances or just in the environment in general which have impact on the intestine, specifically affect the intestinal permeability. Um, and so one wonders whether um, either exposure at a young age or sort of lo low-grade exposure um, 
to uh, some of these byproducts um, uh, is enough of a trigger in those people who are genetically susceptible. So that, for instance, um, you know, we are looking at BPA as an example uh, of exposure. But again, these are substances, you know, you will find in shampoos, you'll find in soaps, you'll find, you know, you'll find in, you know, food stabilizers. It's really across the board. And uh, one wonders whether there is, um, it could be anything or specific. We have, we are, uh, have the ability of looking at certain things that stay in the body for long periods of time. So we're looking at that a little bit, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that. It could be anything as if it has an impact potentially on the intestinal barrier, which then allows the inflammatory reaction to, to start. I didn't. Um, Matthew was diagnosed two years ago, and he, besides the circles and his height, had no symptoms also. Um, so they said the whole family should be tested. We all got tested. I was the only one that came up positive. I went on a gluten-free diet. Um, since then, I haven't felt any different, but there were times when I felt that I had gluten accidentally. And then I realized that I had stomach aches, I had to go to the bathroom more frequently, and I was told that being on a gluten-free diet now, I may have become more sensitive to gluten now. You're supposed to answer, answer, answer the questions also. <laughs> The only, the only thing that I, the answer is not really. The only thing we could say is from the Swedish experience where not only were they introducing food earlier, but they had fortified the foods with gluten in them for reasons that are a little bit unclear to me. Uh, but so, and they had a spike in their celiac incidence. So they were introducing it earlier with higher concentrations. Um, we do know from sort of animal experiments that, you know, the intestinal barrier is certainly more permeable early on. In, in, in animals, it's early through weaning. Um, that's not necessarily 100% true in, 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 in kids, but it, it probably is somewhat true. So I would think that um, it does make sense. However, the, there is one study that looked at the, um, the, the age with which gluten was started and the development of celiac disease and did not see a correlation. But that was Again, it was one study, and um, there are a lot of other factors involved. So it's a great question which, for which we don't know the answer. Um, this is just a piggyback on that question. At what age are studies finding, and I know it depends on if a child or a baby is premature, um, but um, do they find that the intestine is, more mature, is mature enough uh, to handle? Right. That's a great question, and there is no answer. I mean, we do, again, in, for animal studies, it's relatively simple. We do know that when they weaned from breastfeeding onto, onto solids, the intestine barrier matures. Uh, in kids, it's not as clear-cut, so there is a probably a, um, a continuum where the, as the intestine matures, it becomes, the, the barrier becomes more tighter, and therefore they're less likely to develop it. The, the logical thing would be the later the better. Um, um, so the, obviously the more mature the child is and the better the weight gain, the less likely the intestine is to be immature, but there's no hard, fast cutoff like there, like there is in animals. Um, Dr. Levine, have you done any studies looking at um, the predisposition of, like in people that are predisposed to celiac disease, um, preventing it through uh, gluten-free diet, let's say, prior to diagnosis since it takes so long to be diagnosed? Right. Well, I mean, I, I, we've had 
especially with families, since everybody is becoming relatively sophisticated with it. We've had, you know, if you have one or two members of a family and then the mother has another child and the mother says, there's no way in the world I'm going to give this kid gluten. Um, and that is okay for a while. But uh, um, there is no data that says that if you took that one particular child who has a genetic predisposition or we do genetic testing on the, and it shows that yes, they have a genetic predisposition and you then don't give them gluten for four years, that you're then going to, and then give them gluten, that you're then going to prevent the development. I'm sure during that first four years, you're not going to have celiac disease uh, because you're not on gluten. Um, but, but no one doesn't, there's no data that says that if you then waited four years or five years or whatever period of time before you started them, that they would not develop it. That's, I mean, it, it's, it makes some logical sense, again, because if, if the trigger is the intestinal barrier, then it makes somewhat sense, uh, but we don't really know what that trigger is. And again, the trigger could be an infection, and it, we all get infections, and, um, and when you get infections, the intestine is, uh, you know, it's damaged a little bit, and that's why you have diarrhea, whatever it is. Uh, and if at that point you have the genetic predisposition and you're getting gluten, maybe that's a trigger, and that could happen at any particular age. So, there, it's, that's a good question for which we don't know. You mentioned something about the hepatitis B vaccination. I wasn't clear exactly um, what was said. Is that, are you saying that there could, that could be leading to celiac or that's a potential trigger? No, I don't think it's a necessarily a trigger. I think that what we what several studies have found uh, is that in patients with celiac disease, uh, the the, many of those children did not mount a response to the hepatitis vaccine. Now, we all get, we get many vaccines when they're young, and presumably uh, they get, some of these kids get vaccines. Most of these, for instance, the hepatitis vaccine, most of it is given before they're exposed to gluten. Um, but the reason, so the reason for that is unclear, uh, but we do know that a lot of them don't, have not mounted a response. So if you then, you know, get a hepatitis vaccine, and you then test them when they're six, seven, and eight, um, they should have, it should be, it should have shown that you responded to the vaccine, and we found in celiac, celiac patients that it, they don't, or as, don't do it as well. So they oftentimes will need to get revaccinated. It doesn't seem to be happening in a lot of the other vaccines for whatever reason, we're not sure about. Um, so we routinely screen for the hepatitis B in patients with celiac disease, uh, but, um, it could be others as well, and it may be over time we may find that it, it you know, a lot of these vaccines, you, you lose their immunity to it, but we don't know. What is your recommendation or insight into the family who is not all in one place at the same time? So either the parent works late, the kid has sports, or it's, you know, what do you do with family meals? How do you stress? Well, you try to find the times where they are together. So oftentimes it's the weekends and um, emphasize as much together time on the weekends when they, when they are together. And then secondarily, if one parent is home and the other isn't, that that parent sits with their children and, and eats with them um, as, as often as possible. How do you feel about just if neither parent is home encouraging siblings? Is it Oh yeah, siblings and hopefully a babysitter or a nanny is there, that person. Any really, you know, if you look at children in preschool, they sit with their teachers. It doesn't have to be a parent necessarily, but um, a caretaker in some way, shape, or form who's providing a role model for children. Yes, preferably, yes. Um, I talk to a lot of moms who are, uh, eating a salad and feeding their children a completely different meal at the island. And we don't really do a good job of showing our kids how, how to eat and how to navigate all foods when we remove ourselves from their feeding environment. So, yeah. I, I just would ask Jill a question while since put you to work. Um, and that is, let's say, and, and as, as in celiac disease, again, if you have two sets of people, the, the child uh, who's got the celiac disease and the other members of the family who don't, what would you recommend as far as that feeding issues? Yeah. 
So I, I've treated families who um, have children with celiac. I always recommend that everybody goes on gluten-free and that the whole family, and I would do the same if uh, I was managing a child with overweight or obesity. Everybody eats the same way. Everybody eats the same food. Everybody comes together to support uh, whatever the new family dynamic is. So, yes, whole family, totally. It, it only works when you do the whole family, I think. So nobody wants to be on an island all by themselves, you know, eating different food and doing different things. Everybody needs that support. So. Oh, so we'll we'll take uh, just one more question, uh, but then we'll all be at the mix and mingle, so you can continue to ask us questions uh, one on one if you would like to. Um, question for Dr. Lee. Is there? <laughs> Is there any information as to um, our food supply changing, um, for example, with wheat? Is there a different protein structure now than it used to be? Does, does that impact, is there any correlation between that possibility and increase in celiac? Yes, uh, to a certain extent, again, and, and those places where that we looked at that, for sure, again, as I mentioned with the Swedish experience, uh, you know, where they fortified their, their, their wheat products with gluten. Um, so yes, that's true to a certain extent. Um, uh, and again, I think some of the wheat has been higher concentration of, of, of gluten. Um, but I still, but that doesn't explain that, that huge spike in, 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 in the incidence. Um, yeah, and I, I remember when I um, when I first came to New York from Boston, and Boston has a huge Irish population. Um, it was thought that celiac disease is most common in the Irish population. We saw a moderate amount, and I remember coming to New York and saying, after a couple of years, and saying, "Where are all the celiac patients? It's nobody around." And unfortunately, it became an epidemic. Um, and so, it's not only a purely diet. It's not only genetics. There's a lot of other factors which. We just don't know which are which are at, at play for this rise uh, in in in, in sea level disease. Okay, thank you very much. Please join us next door. We'll have more food and beverages. And thank you for coming tonight. <laughs>